the piano, and I'll be talking about this for a bit. Is this working? Um, in November 2018, so just last year, Professor Yi and Q announced that uh, the birth of two baby girls to which he had edited their genome. He uh, said that these two baby girls were born uh, normal and healthy, and that he had changed their DNA so that they would become resistant to HIV. No data or any paper has been published for us to be able to check what has been done. So we have very little detail on what he did, how he did it, and who knew about this experiment. The few details that we have are the ones that he gave during the talk at this conference. So, at the point of his announcement, it, it provoked quite a shock within the, within the world, both the academic uh, community and also the society in general. And many people said that the experiment that he did was very premature and a bit rushed. But uh, today I thought it is better for all of us to be on the same page that I will show you what he did, how he did it, and uh, uh, what are some of the technical and ethical implications of, of his work. So, um, Professor He and Q said that he wanted to make babies that are resistant to HIV. HIV is a virus that can infect immune cells. Once it infects the immune cells, it makes them weaker and weaker and weaker until they can no longer fight infection. And if the HIV is not treated, it is fatal. But interestingly enough, there is 1% of the world population that is immune to HIV. It does not get infected with HIV. And these people, the scientists discovered that these people have a different CCR5 receptor. This receptor, the CCR5 here, exists outside of the immune cells. And the HIV virus is sneaky, can recognize this receptor and infect the cell. The people that are immune to HIV naturally, they have a modified CCR5 receptor that the HIV cannot recognize and cannot use it to infect the cells. And as such, people that have a different CCR5 receptor are immune to HIV. Professor Lee and Q wanted to use the same idea. Change the normal CCR5 receptor that most of us have and change it to a form that the HIV virus cannot recognize. How do you change the receptor outside of the cell? The easiest way is to change DNA. DNA is pretty much like an instruction manual for the cell. If the cell wants to produce the CCR5 receptor, it will go into the DNA, check the DNA, find the instruction manual for the CCR5 receptor, in this case it would be the gene of the CCR5, read the instruction manual, and then produce the receptor as the manual tells it to. So if you change the instruction manual, you will change the product. And it's exactly what it wants to do. You change the DNA to change the receptor. How do you change DNA? You can do this using gene editing technologies, such as the CRISPR-Cas system. This is a system that can read the DNA, find the gene that you want, in our case we want the CCR5, find this gene, once it finds it, it cuts it. Once DNA is cut, it is easier to edit or to change. And this was exactly what it did. It changed the CCR5 uh, gene, and as such, the cell can only produce this changed form of the CCR5 receptor. So the cell is immune to HIV because the HIV cannot recognize the CCR5. But how do you go from one cell to an entire body? To do that, we need to think about in vitro fertilization. Professor Li and Q recruited couples, Chinese couples, where the mother does not have HIV and the father is HIV positive. It is known in science that the risk of transmission uh, of, from fathers that are, are HIV positive to babies is very low. But anyways, he recruited couples where the father is HIV positive, he collected an egg from the mother and the sperm from the father, and then he proceeded to do in vitro fertilization, where he injected the sperm into the egg, and at the same time that he injected the sperm, he also injected the CRISPR-Cas9 system to be able to edit the cell. And I brought a little video to show you how the fertilization works. This is the egg. And this needle here, there is this white dot there that is the sperm. And you will see it being injected into the cell. So the needle goes, it uh, makes a, pierces the egg, and then uh, collects a little bit of what's inside the egg, and then releases the, the sperm. 
sperm inside. And that's how the fertilization works. Once the sperm is fused with the egg, then you get one single cell. This cell is called the zygote. And it, has, it is at this stage of the zygote, when you only have one cell, that you want the gene editing to work. You already have loaded the CRISPR-Cas system, so now it can alter the CCR5 receptor and you will get one cell that has a different CCR5 receptor that is HIV resistant. This one cell will then divide itself into two, and each of these cells will divide into two, and this process will continue until you have about 16 cells. Your next step is to find out if the CRISPR-Cas system did its job, and if this cell really is changed to the new CCR5 receptor. To do this, you can do a medical procedure that is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. This means that after three to five days after fertilization, when you have many cells, you go into the embryo and you take one cell out, and you then analyze this cell to find out if the DNA has been changed. This is actually a procedure that is done nowadays if the parents suffer from a genetic disease and they want to be sure that the child will not suffer from this disease as well, you can do this procedure. And here uh, I'll show you how it's done. You remove the protective layer around the egg and then with a pipette that will come there, you remove, you suck one of the cells out and then these cells, as the previous talk said, can be destroyed and the DNA inside analyzed. Once you find the right embryos that have been changed as you want them to be changed, then you let these embryos grow and develop until they form this structure here that is called a blastocyst. These groups of cells that can be implanted into the mother, nine months later, you, a baby is born. And because these embryos have a change on DNA, then this baby will only be able to produce the modified CCR5 receptor, and as such, it is HIV resistant. And this is how Professor Ian Q made the first two babies to have a gene edited. These babies, Lulu and Nana, at the point of his announcement, this really shocked the world. But you had always two fractions. You have some people, both in the science community and in the normal uh, public, that would say that moves like this, experiments, radical experiments like this, is what makes the gene editing field move forward, is what makes us achieve better and go higher on our imagination. On the other hand, you have a group of scientists that say this experiment was done very prematurely, it was not well planned, and moves like this create fear in the population that will then lead to the formation of laws that can prevent the further, uh, the further development of this field. So let's take a look at what are the implications, technical and ethical, of this experiment. I will not be able to go into every single implication, but I will do three of each. Let's start with the technical implications. Some of the technical implications are related with the use of the CRISPR-Cas9 system, with the gene editing technology itself. CRISPR-Cas system, although it's a fantastic system, it's one of the best ones that we have to edit genes, it's still very recent. It is used in the lab for about 10 years, so we are still learning the consequences of using it. And recently we have found out that even though this system is super efficient, it can also lead to some alterations on the DNA that you did not expect. So it will change the gene that you want, but it can also change some genes somewhere else that you were not expecting. These alterations can be as non-important as a baby being born with a blue eye and a brown eye, and as serious as this baby being more likely to develop cancer or being born with a with a malformed uh, liver. So um, these non-intended effects are hard to predict, and sometimes they are even hard to find out even by analyzing the DNA uh, before the implantation, like we saw before. Another thing that we need to think about is that the CCR5 receptor exists in our bodies for a reason. Its job is not to be there to uh, let the HIV virus in. It is there to actually protect us against the virus. So once you change the CCR5 receptor to a form that it can no longer work properly, then 
uh, studies have found that you are more likely to, su to suffer severe uh, uh, side effects and severe forms or symptoms of infections from West Ham virus, tick-borne virus, yellow fever and Zika virus. And although these virus might all sound very tropical, it's actually not so true because a study in Spain has found that people who have a change in this receptor are actually four times more likely than average to die from complications from the flu virus. Another thing that we need to think about is that because these babies have all of their cells in all, all of all the body has been changed, so even their sexual cells have been changed. This means that whatever uh, consequences good or bad come about because of the gene editing will be passed along to the next generation and then to the next generation. So these are some of the technical implications about the work when using gene editing technologies in human embryos. Let's now discuss some of the ethical implications. Professor Guillen recruited fathers that were HIV positive, and we know that the risk of, of infection from a father to a baby is very low. And nowadays, there are uh, medicines called antivirals that are safe, cheap, and a proven method of treating HIV uh, infection. They can even protect these fathers from contaminating their baby or even the mother. So they are effective. So now the point is about is it ethical to use an unproven and uh, an unproven treatment that we don't really know the consequences of? It's when there is a safe and cheap method to treat these children for, uh, to protect them from HIV. Another ethical aspect that we need to think about is that when Professor Lee and Q did this uh, project, and also when gene editing technologies came about, it was agreed within the scientific community that we did not know enough about this technology to use it in human embryos for pregnancy. And it was agreed that we would not do this right now. When he did this, he broke the trust of the scientific community. More importantly, and maybe more concerning, is that by doing it in such a secrecy, he raises very serious ethical and civil rights uh, concerns about the way that he did the experiment and if the patient, or the parents in this case, knew about the risks and the consequences of doing gene editing in their babies. Another thing that we need to consider, and it's actually something that is being discussed a lot right now in our media, is that what is the limit between making a baby, a baby better looking or that has better skills in music to treating a disease? What is the difference between enhancement and treatment? If you ask to most of the world population, they will tell you that gene editing is fine as long as you are treating for a disease. But then it comes about what you define as a disease. Because if, you, if I ask you, do you consider blindness or deafness a disease, your answer might be yes, but maybe if I ask a deaf person if he feels like he's sick, he might tell me no. So where do you define disease? These are not so easy questions. And we don't have them right now. But the truth is, CRISPR babies exist. This is not something that you can ignore and pretend that it will never happen again. This is not true. There are already people claiming that they want to have the next CRISPR baby. So we need to face the fact that this is happening and it will happen. So right now, there is a large discussion all around the world to which I believe that all of us need to participate on. Because right now, there are discussions all over the world about what rules, legislation, laws need to be applied to protect the future patients so that no more ethical problems arise from this and that people know the risks and the need for this alteration on their genome. But we also need to be careful that when applying these laws to protect the people, that we are also not preventing the development of this research. Because for HIV, we know the gene that can have an impact, but for many other diseases, we don't really know what causes them and how we can prevent them using this technology. So this still needs to be for the development. And it's not by creating very restrictive laws that we will be able to do this. And as Carl Singer said, um, the world is a sober debate about the pros and cons of CRISPR instead of a paranoid ban on the technology. And it is with 
this uh, sentence that I want to leave you um, to have a proper conversation about the CRISPR uh, babies and gene editing technologies. And I put together uh, a file full of some uh, um, documents and some links for interviews that I think will be good for you to learn more about this technology. It includes some uh, testimonies from mothers that have genetic diseases and how they feel about uh, having their babies uh, go through gene editing technologies, for example. So take a look if you're interested in learning more. And that's it. Thank you very much. There is just one there. Can you take any bring the microphone? Thank you, very simple. Um, so what do you think an appropriate level of oversight and control of the technology would look like? How, how do you keep the genie involved? Okay, so you're asking me the question to solve the world problem. Uh -huh. Yes, <laughs> lovely. Um, the truth is, I don't really know. I think these rules need to be strict enough that they are protecting the people and that we have the best interests of the people in mind. But they also need to be some gray area because what, for example, in this HIV, we know some of the risks, but for some other, of doing gene editing technology, right? But for some others, we don't. And these risks that I tell you, they are not 100%. You might do it one time and it goes perfectly, and then the second time you do it, it goes horribly. So you cannot prevent everything from happening, but you should try your best to make sure that everyone does it as safely as you can. But this is a very, very hard question, and it's not so easy to answer. Okay, more questions? More tricky, there is another question in the center. Yeah. Please don't tell me to fix world peace. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Anyway, it's all right to talk. Um, just let's assume that this uh, method of modifying the CCR fiber sector is going to be a center in the future. And at some point, 10 or more percent of the population will have this modified CCR fiber sector. Won't the uh, um, HI virus virus uh, adapt to this new modified receptor and then everyone is actually um, yeah, affected? Could you make a repeat because I think it was not very well. Yes, yeah, so uh, if we start doing this, then everyone will have the, the, the different CCR5 receptor. Will the virus adapt to then use something else instead of this receptor? The answer is most likely. Uh, <laughs> because the virus has an incredible capacity to adapt to, to, to new things. And the CCR5 receptor is actually the most common way that the HIV virus gets in. But there are some other forms of the virus that can get in through other ways. So it's not for food. And I think you are right. If the virus feels like it's dying, then it probably will change something to find somewhere else to go in. I, I, I think it's very interesting. I think it's a very good point to add that this should be considered in the discussion as well, right? Um, what are the risks of applying this for the specific case? It is very good. Are there more questions right here right now? Or, yes, there's one. So, is there a way to do gene editing on a person who's already born, or so far there are technologies only to do gene editing on embryos or cells? It's exactly the other way around. So, right now, gene editing is used as a medical treatment for some cases of some diseases, such, for example, uh, people that. Uh, that the bubble babies, the babies that are born without an immune system, then you can do some gene therapy uh, techniques to help these uh, people develop an immune system. And there are, right now, there are a bunch of studies coming out of people doing gene editing to solve genetic problems. But it's all, it has always been done in adults, because then you change your, uh, your cells that do not pass along to the next generation. So the entire thing of doing gene editing in embryos and why this was so shocking is because you are affecting the next generations. But gene editing is actually a very good technique and it's used today uh, for medical purposes. 
Thank you. Now I'm afraid that the back seats already feel the pizza smell and they get nervous for me. <laughs> so I invite you all now to the break. Please ask more questions to Liliana and to our other speakers here in the break. Enjoy the pizza, enjoy the and let's take Liliana again.